Schwab Advisor Services is proud to support the RIA Edge podcast and equally proud to support independent financial advisors like you. In a challenging year, how did 68% of firms surveyed in Schwab's RIA benchmarking study meet or exceed their new client goals? By following key success factors, such as leveraging new technology, adapting strategies to win new business and stay connected with their clients, while also attracting and developing the right talent. The Schwab RIA benchmarking study is just one of many ways they provide you with the insights and resources needed to succeed and grow. Get the full picture at advisorservices.schwab.com. Welcome to the RIA Edge podcast. This is Mark Bruno, Managing Director of the Wealth Management Group at Informa. And we are thrilled to have a very special guest, Michael, Michael Tiedemann, Chief Executive Officer of Alvaria Tiedemann, also known as affectionately Alti. Michael, thank you very much for joining us here today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for having me. I appreciate being here. Yeah, we've been looking forward to having you on for a really long time. I think you know, what you have done over the last you know, year or so, and obviously you know, years leading up to your transaction that you announced in the beginning of this year, has been incredibly interesting and you know, very different in the wealth management space, particularly at a time where there's been a ton of merger and acquisition activity. So before we get into some of the details for you know our listeners, I think it would be really helpful, Michael, if we just level set a bit. Yeah, you know, I, I think a lot of our listeners are probably familiar with you and the Tiedemann Group. But when you look back in the beginning of this year and you completed the deal with Alvarium Investments um, and also Cartesian, I think it would be helpful if you could just maybe tell the story of who Alti is today and how you came to be. Today, Alti is in total about $60 billion of assets, 40 of which are on the global wealth management business and 20 of which are on the real estate and alternatives side of the business. So we have the business is really to be thought of as two, obviously shared ownership, but separate operating platforms within one business. And the purpose for that is to have the benefits of all of the activities and the investment uh, capabilities and information flow, but to be able to provide that to the wealth platform without conflict. So uh, they really are separate client bases across the two business lines. But that so that's that's sort of a very quick summary. We're operating in 11 countries, 24 cities, about 430 employees today across all those offices. It's incredible the reach that you now have. And I should also ask you to share a little bit more about the nature of the transaction, right, that you completed in the beginning of this year. Alti now is one of the largest publicly traded companies in the wealth management space. And there are not a lot, I should say, um, but I'm very curious to get your take and sort of a little bit of background on the strategy for teaming up with Alvarium and why you felt like the public markets were the right way to go. So could you offer us, Michael, just a little bit of a glimpse into your strategy, and then we can get into the vision for what Alti will be moving forward? Sure. So it goes back to the very beginning, which was really, we we had from day one, and this is late 99, 2000, we were really setting out on the wealth side and the advisory side to build a business that was an open architecture investment model, a fully integrated trust company. So fiduciary capabilities and services out, operated out of Delaware. Uh, and to be a business that had a, a multifamily office service model. So we saw their you know, the huge amount of wealth back then, and it obviously has continued to grow, that we saw transferring. And we saw the way in which many trust companies were serving, poorly serving, or financial advisory services had a lot of embedded conflicts, very poor reporting, and, and, and service that was being diminished as there are a lot of mergers. If you remember in the late 90s, a lot of the banks were combining. And, and yeah. so service professionals, you know, double or triple the number of families they had to serve. And so Almost by definition, the service models were collapsing. And we saw that as just a great opportunity to be very focused on the high end, to be very explicit about the fact that we had we were going to operate without conflict. Um, and the, the only fee that we receive in Tiedemann Advisors, or did receive in Tiedemann Advisors, was a transparent fee paid by the client. There are no other fees across the platform. And then, but having this all be integrated, and as we did that, as we built that, as we saw the changing needs of clients and of families over time and of, of organizations 
uh, and obviously the changing market backdrop, you think about all the events that occurred over that time frame, we continue to invest into our business as the client's needs were evolving. We said, you know, this the space of impact investing was rapidly changing and becoming very relevant. Family dynamics and family governance as a internal skill set to be able to deliver to families transferring businesses or just regular family dynamics. These are all things that we really began to uh, invest in more heavily. And then as we began to have families that had assets overseas, we really realized that the importance of being able to operate and serve our families in a consistent manner that were cross-border. And so that's what took us into Switzerland and London in, in 2019 and 2021. Um, so that, but the the main purpose was to be able to serve families through generations. And so there was a permanence in terms of our mindset. We were never building to sell our business. We were building to create a perpetual business. And that's part of the reason why that does link to the public listing. And I can obviously get more in depth about that as we talk later. But uh, the, the permanence really was one of the defining characteristics of the business and of our, of, you know, the leadership and the founding partners mindset when we set it up day one. It's interesting. You know, I, re I remember having a conversation you know, about two or three years ago after we had done some research, just looking at growth rates in the RA channel and going back to, you mentioned the late nineties when all the banks were consolidating and the RA channel was just starting to really you know, emerge. Um, it was in its infancy, of course, but you know, most of the RAs were running practices, right? Fast forward 10 years, you know, a lot of them were running businesses, you know, fast forward another 10 years and the firms that have been the most successful are really platforms now. I mean, the way you've described Alti in its current state, it certainly is what I think is probably one of the best models to demonstrate what an international wealth management platform truly looks like. And there are not a lot of firms, your size, your scope, I and mean, who have access across the globe. So I'm very interested to kind of hear a little bit more about what the next chapter is because I think, or actually we may be in the next chapter, but just the very beginning of it, right? But just on the public market side of things, I'm sure you had a number of options that you could consider as you looked at ways that you can continue to grow and accelerate the growth of your company. But what was it about the public market opportunity that spoke to you specifically? That's a great question. So there, there, a very important nuance is there may be a reason why there aren't many wealth management companies that are public. And these are really good businesses. The businesses have their, let's call it a realistic growth trajectory. When you have good internal dynamic, organic growth and people to help drive growth, but there are constraints to that. There are, there are human capital constraints in terms of the ability to service large families. And so there, there are some capacity governors of the business. So as a public company, standalone, that business line, I'm not sure that I would have, this is just a personal view, I'm not sure that I would have pushed to take Tiedemann Advisors public as a standalone business. Yep. Having real estate, both public and private, having alternatives and GP stakes and, and other asset management initiatives alongside it that have their own growth trajectories, their own ability to scale, their own profit centers, and their you know, a lower correlation to the capital markets or, or certainly to the wealth line. That big, it brings you know a durability of revenue that brings a, a, a sort of a differentiation for how you can grow over time that if you just had one business line, I think would be harder. So we that just... The starting point, uh, the public markets wouldn't have been an option in my mind, had it not been for the dynamism of you know combining you know all of these uh, the you know, two business lines and all the activities. Yeah, that's good to hear in a lot of ways because I think yeah, you know, there's been some discussion around you know some of the potential opportunities, but there's not enough discussion really about how time consuming, how prepared you know, some of uh, you know, these firms that are listening to this interview right now might be to you know, transform into a publicly traded company that has a lot of other requirements, a lot of other asks um, that might be new and completely different. So having the platform, the diversified platform that you have certainly makes a tremendous amount of sense. When you look at the wealth management business, I'm curious as you look across the landscape, what and we talk a lot about merger and acquisition activity on this podcast, and we talk to a lot of companies that are professional buyers and growing through M&A. 
Yeah. What is your view, you know, now that you are a publicly you know, listed company, the growth opportunities right now that are available to Alti through merger and acquisition activity? For Alti and our, our business model really is focused on the high end of the market and or really the ultra high net worth uh, multifamily office cusp size uh, family. So almost by definition, there are less people that do that exclusively. So mm-hmm. number one, number two, there are people out there that have capital that have sponsors effectively that bought into their firm and have turned their platforms, as you described, into acquisition platforms. And some of them are having great success doing that. Others, I think, you know, time will tell. We'll see how that all unfolds. This really is the first vintage of private equity backed roll-up strategies. And yeah. and there's some very good private equity firms. And I think, you know, but they have a job to do. They have a job to make an investment and then return two to three, at least two to three times on their money in five to seven years or 10 years at the latest, you know, take capital out along the way. So they have a goal that, or a set of goals and needs that may not be perfectly aligned with your operating platform, or most importantly, with your clients and the service you deliver. And sort of your ability, if you're going to be going that route, you need to have people on staff and the capacity to execute that and to do it so that your business is improving as you grow, not diluting or dilutive to the the client offering and the client service and and the culture of a firm. So it's it's really important that that's something that if you're engaging in that conversation, that you are able to sort of roll the clock forward three, five years and understand where your you know your limitations are. Now you can hire for that and they can support some of that. But we will see how that goes. I think the the it certainly drove multiples. Mm-hmm. So I'm not one to begrudge private equity managers who who ultimately driven the multiple of of wealth management firms higher in the private markets. There's an inverted multiple between public and private markets. The private markets traded the premium to public markets within the wealth management lines. We'll see if that changes over time. But that, as we sit here today, that's that's an interesting dynamic. So when we think about acquisitions, we think that we're talking about human talent acquisitions. That's, yes, there are revenues and, and earnings and what have you. There's geography. There are capabilities that they bring, and there's capacity, and there's cultural fit. These are all really key components of anyone looking at. We've done in the U.S. two in 23 years, so mm-hmm. we are far from you know a roll-up firm. We were mostly organic growth throughout our history, and believe strongly that's the best way, the healthiest way to drive the business as goes as you go forward. But bringing on great teams, it's really an assessment of those people of how they serve and work with their clients, of what their ambitions are, how much alignment can you can create. Yeah. And then ultimately how much growth can be driven by collaborating with them. You know, maybe they're in a part of the country or world where that local global dynamic is really opens up growth opportunities for the for that team on the ground. And that's really what we hope to drive, uh, organically drive once once we brought anyone into the firm. Yeah, I appreciate that context. I think it's very helpful for our listeners. And, and RA Edge at its core is about growth. So uh, maybe we take it a step further. I would like to get your sense. And this is a two-part question. One, if you're looking at a firm as a potential partner acquisition opportunity, how are you assessing their growth, right? If it's good and high quality growth, you know, how do you distinguish that from a firm that may be growing a little bit less, say, strategically and intentionally? And then part two is where are you seeing specific growth opportunities in the wealth market for Alti? So maybe we can just start by how you're assessing quality growth. Understanding, and again, there's a range of size of firms that you can evaluate and let's start with that. And then mm-hmm. what what they're delivering to their client base or prospective client base. I think that that's a key point of evaluation because if they are in it really an investment only firm versus more holistic in terms of the service model or maybe they lead with administrative matters i.e family office type services and then they eventually lead in their investment portfolios and what have you so really you really have to understand sort of how they have presenting how they are presenting themselves to any prospective new client and then uh, how much depth is there in the organization driving that historic growth so is it one two five people how many like how many people are really participating in that because 
once they are on your platform and part of the firm, you need to understand the depth you have within that team, or maybe it's an office to be able to participate with future growth and and how many of them can actually be drivers of that. And so it's, there's that, again, that human capital evaluation is a big one. I mean, the numbers are what the numbers are. You see what percentage of prospects actually closed over, you know, the last three to five years, the size profile that you're continually getting in front of. So you get a sense of sort of maybe the local market dynamics where they are having success, you know, why are they having success? Really trying to pull that out of them so we understand what they do well. I don't think anyone has a monopoly on great ideas or or great business practices. So we find when teams are joining or firms or or in conversations with them, it's really an opportunity for us to evaluate how they've been successful, how they've gotten to where they are and sort of what has worked for them, because there are things you can pick up from from all these conversations. Yeah, I think your point just around, you even mentioned you know, close rates or conversion rate. How do you determine if the growth is scalable and repeatable is an important distinction between you know, good growth and great growth in a lot of cases. I mean, obviously, the human capital piece is right at the center of it. When you do look at you know, some of the growth opportunities for Alti, I've said it again and again on this podcast, you know, while markets may be in sort of bear market territory, I firmly believe that it is a bull market for financial advice and wealth management for so many reasons. Um, I think there is a greater need for professional financial advice than there ever has been before. Um, you are working with the very sort of upper end right, of the market. So I'm curious you know, how that you know, comment resonates with you and also where you're seeing growth opportunities you know, organically for Alti moving forward. I agree with the comment and I mean, it's self-serving for me to agree with that comment, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do think, well, for a couple of reasons, one is we just, we're exiting a period of zero rates for 12 plus years and that the distortion towards risk assets, the distortion towards passive investing is in process of changing, you know, the amount of money that was flowing into credit versus two-year treasury. I you know, just as the data point, you look at the two-year treasury today, it started the month of February at the yield of 4.10. It's now at 4.85. And so, you know, you start looking at short-dated treasuries as a place to have capital. The, the cost of capital adjustment that we're going through right now is flowing uh, in some ways very quickly through public equity markets and growth assets. And that happened beginning in October of 21 and continued obviously through 22, you're seeing it now flow through into real estate and longer dated, you know, investment assets, private equity, LBO portfolios. And so there's this adjustment going on, which means there's underlying complexity. It means that asset classes are being repriced. And there's the possibility that some of them will be repriced overly done. And so creating opportunities, but the ability to be an active advisor today versus 18 months ago is dramatically better or more important. But beyond just that market view, and that's my personal market view, beyond that, there's there are other ways in which you can work with families and and advise them. And you know, whether that be thinking about you know estate structures that are in place, thinking about impact investing as a a way to engage the next generation with respect to how they're going to allocate capital. Very different than just related, but different than ESG screening. This is really talking about private market investment activity uh, where families can evaluate the non-financial results of their investment decisions. And families can really look at their capital as, as something to activate in a manner that aligns with things they really care about as a family. And it really is a way to change the dynamic of a conversation with between generations related to the capital, uh, where oftentimes there's discomfort, you know, having those conversations. Either the parents don't want to talk to the kids about it, it's too much, or the, the, the children sometimes feel uncomfortable talking about this wealth that's all of a sudden their responsibility. So there's there's a lot of ways that you can, as an advisor right now, have engaged in conversations that are, are meaningful for families and ultimately create the framework for hopefully your success and you know what is looked at 10 20 years later as foundational decisions that were made and guided by the advisory teams and i can appreciate that you're in a very different part of the market than many of our listeners but 
I thought it was interesting. You touched on obviously the trust and estate element, also the impact you know, investing piece. We've really seen in a lot of the research that we've done over the next you know, three to five years, the role of a financial advisor and you know, his or her firm, I should say, will evolve, right? And will become more of an intergenerational wealth you know, manager than just you know, an in-the-moment financial advisor who's focused on a unit, you know, the matriarch and the patriarch, right? It really is managing the entire family, which brings with it a number of very interesting dynamics. <laughs> And you know, it, it will be fun to observe from a distance, <laughs> I can say. As we come to a close here, Michael, I'm curious, is there anything that you would say to our audience if there's a, an individual who's running you know, his or her own RIA and they're thinking about growth opportunities in this market, which is obviously very, very different than you know, the market that we've been in for the last decade or so. Anything that you would advise in terms of assessing growth opportunities and acting on those growth opportunities? Well, if you're asking related to corporate decisions they might make, uh, or are you asking more in terms of just organic growth and how they uh, might think about growing their business over time? I, I just want to make sure I'm answering the, the question as you. It's a combination of the two, I would say, right? Identifying where there are growth opportunities, but then also making sure that you have the right structure and support to execute on that without obviously reinventing your business model. Yeah. Okay. Great. So I'll answer the, the latter point first, which is systems and your system architecture as a firm that can be, should be a benefit to being part of a larger firm. You should have ultimately, as you move a smaller practice into a larger, whether it be a merger or whether you're being acquired into a firm, your clients should have the benefit or, or receive the benefit of your better systems, delivery of information, coordination of, of, of all the moving pieces of you know their portfolios and ultimately a lot of the information uh, in their you know, family structures, what have you. So in addition to systems being better, pricing. As you grow, you should have and your clients should directly feel the benefit of better pricing, better terms, lower cost of, of delivery, of, the net cost of delivery of service. And that should be absolutely aligned with a growing scale of any business that that scale flows through and benefits your underlying clients. In terms of the corporate decisions you might make in terms of you know, joining a firm or either merging, selling, buying, I think people overcomplicate things. First of all, everyone, you should... <laughs> Be very realistic with all of your assessment. You should use sort of discount anything that you see as great positives and add a premium to the challenges because it is not, you know, change is not easy. It's also um, harder for some people throughout your organization. I think if you break it down to its simplest form, creating as much alignment as you can possibly create that ultimately benefits your clients and ultimately retains the really great talent that you have in your firm. And so the, the talent that goes you know, from, let's say, the senior most down to you know, mid and lower level people that have great potential to continue to work with clients. These are all things that need to be considered that are ultimately are what matters you know, five, 10 years later. If you're going down the path of completing a transaction and it, it's at the detriment of the client experience and ultimately the talent in your organization, you'll know you made a mistake. It'll be too late. So you really need to sort of spend a lot of time on that and understand if you're joining a larger firm, how they've retained people. Talk to those other firms that have joined them in the past about how people were treated, how decisions were made. Did anyone elevate into the leadership ranks of the larger firm from these newer firms? So on and so forth. So these are all, I think, key things to consider. Yeah, I think if we just wrote those out, you gave our listeners a very good checklist of questions that they should be asking if they're going through that process. The only thing I would add to it as well is um, I find it interesting how few people who are thinking about selling or thinking about merging actually think about the role that they would like to have post transaction, right? Do you want the same exact role or do you want to be more focused? Maybe you just would like to manage money, right? Maybe you would like to work with your 10 largest clients. Maybe you just want to do business development. Um, I think that's also one of the interesting parts about all of the M&A activity that's taken place is the optionality. So the only thing that I would add to your very robust and very comprehensive you know, checklist of questions would be 
that self-assessment. And Mike, before we let you ride, I should ask, is there anything that I didn't ask that I should have asked you? We haven't talked much about the non-U.S. competitive landscape. And I don't want to sound like an American making an American comment about <laughs> the U.S. was you know 10 years out in front of the rest of the world. The U.S. was 10 years out in, the, yeah. in front of the rest of the world with the fragmentation of the wealth space. And the primary reason why is because jurisdictional currency regulatory framework as you go from France to Switzerland to England to Italy to Singapore, et cetera, is substantial. So that the banks have it, the banks, that is the key architecture that uh, in addition to you know, some other services and systems, what have you, that they offer advisors so that the advisors' client bases can traffic across those jurisdictions where they might have you know, assets and homes and what have you. So we think an opportunity to compete against the banks at the high end, we essentially match the jurisdictional coverage, the regulatory footprint, et cetera. And then it really is about continuing to add advisors within those and build sort of, let's call it semi-organically or uh, by aqua hire, you know, bringing people in and continuing to densify our offices. I think that's a really great and specific opportunity that, that we have as a firm. Yeah. And thank you for bringing that up. I appreciate it. It's definitely something that we'll want to monitor and check back with you and the firm just to see how things are progressing. We don't talk about the international opportunities all that much on this podcast, simply because of many of the reasons that you decided. We've talked obviously about cross-border with Canada at times. We've talked about you know Australia, but it is obviously a very fragmented market with a lot of exceptions and a lot of rules that are difficult for a typical or more traditional wealth manager to navigate. So we'll want to monitor your progress because you are absolutely <laughs> a leading indicator. Um, so thank you for bringing that up, Mike. I appreciate it. And Mike, thank you very much for stopping by and spending as much time as you did walking through not only the story of how Tiedemann became what is now Alti, but also what the vision is. I think it was incredibly interesting for me, and I'm sure it is incredibly helpful for our audience. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. And I appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk to all your listeners. Again, thank you for stopping by. And a reminder to our audience that the RIA Edge main event is taking place in Hollywood, Florida on May 21st through May 24th. So mark your calendars and save the date. And we hope to see you there. But in the meantime, Mike, thank you again for joining. Thank you to all of our listeners for stopping by. On behalf of the RIA Edge and the wealth management team here at Informa, I'm Mark Bruno. We'll see you on the very next episode of the RIA Edge podcast. Schwab Advisor Services is proud to support the RIA Edge podcast and equally proud to support independent financial advisors like you. In a challenging year, how did 68% of firms surveyed in Schwab's RIA benchmarking study meet or exceed their new client goals? By following key success factors such as leveraging new technology, adapting strategies to win new business and stay connected with their clients, while also attracting and developing the right talent. The Schwab RIA benchmarking study is just one of many ways they provide you with the insights and resources needed to succeed and grow. Get the full picture at advisorservices.schwab.com.